The chief executive of Hong Kong airline Cathay Pacific, Rupert Hogg, has suddenly resigned a week after the company was threatened by Beijing with a safety ban over staff who had participated in democra uh, democracy protests. In recent days, Cathay Pacific had moved to sack two pilots and two ground staff who had been involved in the democracy protests after the Chinese aviation regulator issued a safety warning and demanded the airline provide details of all staff flying over Chinese airspace. China said last week that it would not allow Cathay flights crewed by people who have taken part in illegal demonstrations, protests and violent acts to use its airspace. A rule the airline said it would follow. A Cathay Pacific pilot was among 40 people charged with rioting on the 28th of July as police stepped up a crackdown on protests. A female cabin crew member of the uh, unidentified airline uh, was among those arrested last Sunday. Participation of its employees in the pro-democracy protests is not the only issue Cathay Pacific is struggling with. The political turmoil in Asia's financial hub over the last three months has hit Cathay's earnings and stock prices. Hogg will be replaced as CEO by Augustus Tang, the chief executive of Hong Kong Aircraft Engineering Company. Recycling waste is one of the biggest challenges of modern civilization. The problem is so big that many countries around the world have sought to dispose of their waste by exporting it to other poorer nations. So how does the trash economy work? Let's take a look at this next report. One man's trash is another man's treasure. It's an old adage. The trash recycling industry is estimated to be worth a whopping $200 billion annually. Till 2017, China was the biggest importer of trash in the world, accounting for recycling almost 56% of the plastic trash generated. But all that changed in 2018 when China suddenly imposed curbs on the quantum and quality of trash which could be imported. This has resulted in trash being exported to other nations of Southeast Asia and Africa. For instance, in the village of Bangun in Indonesia, farmers have shifted from cultivation to sorting and recycling waste. I used to be a farmer and now I'm sorting rubbish simply because I get more by sorting rubbish than I do by farming. If I'm farming, I need to wait three months to get results. But if I'm sorting rubbish, we can make money in a day, two days or even a week. It is the cold logic of economy which is now driving many farmers across villages in Indonesia to take to sorting and recycling waste. In agriculture, a farmer needs to wait for at least three months before they make money out of cultivation. But sorting trash helps an individual get paid on a weekly basis. In one week, you can earn more than $35, sometimes more than $70. If there's no rubbish, the minimum the workers can earn is 7 to $14 per week, whereas farming needs them to wait. But not everyone is in favor of this flourishing trash economy. China cut down on importing waste due to the detrimental impact which recycling certain kind of plastics was having on health and environment. And Indonesia too is witnessing protests. Activists want the government to ban the import of toxic trash from the West. Our country has been labeled a dirty country as we are the second largest importer of waste in the world after China. The sea has been polluted by China. Now America is adding their rubbish. America doesn't care about Indonesia and is very unethical. The relations between the countries are good, but sending this garbage is clearly a violation of the law. Recently, the Indonesian government returned over 210 tons of waste to Australia after it was found that Australia had sent hazardous materials such as used diapers, electronic waste, etc. in containers meant for waste paper. The activists contend that this is just the first step. 
They want the government to be more proactive in ensuring that Indonesia doesn't turn into a dustbin of the world. Bureau report, Vion, World is One.